All right, so 5.4 part two is what we'll finish up first, and then we're gonna take a look at 5.5, and that will finish up chapter five. Okay, so that'll be really the end of the algebra part uh, of the class. Okay, so let's look at solving an exponential growth and decay problem algebraically. We've done these problems before, okay, a couple weeks ago, but the way we did them was graphically. Okay, I'll remind you how we did it graphically, but really I want to focus today on uh, using algebra. Now the whole reason we had a problem solving these algebraically, the reason we've never done it, is because you end up with a variable in the exponent. The only way to deal with variables in the exponent is to use a log. We didn't know logs. Now we do. All right, so just a reminder of what the exponential growth and decay formula looks like. Usually it's the amount as a function of time, like an amount of people or an amount of trees or you know whatever it is. It's the initial, whatever that is, initial population, initial amount of material, but it's some initial amount times 1 plus r to the t. r is your growth rate as a decimal. So growth rate as a decimal. Now, if it was a minus, it would be a decay rate. So it, it could be a plus if it's growth or a minus if it's decay. Okay, but that's the formula we had, I think, back in section 5. maybe 5.1. Oh. Oh. So we're going to look at a problem that we've done before. Not, not just similar, but if you look back in your notes, this is the exact same problem we did back when we studied exponential growth and decay. We had a population that was starting with 50,000 peoples, peoples, people, increasing at a rate of 2.5% yearly. The question is, how long will it take the population to reach 100,000 people? So first thing we want to do is set up an equation that represents the situation. Now, the first thing we have to figure out is, is this a growth problem or a decay problem? Because that's going to control whether or not we do a 1 plus r or a 1 minus r. I think there's a certain word in there that gives it away that it is growth. Matt? It's increasing or it's, it's growing? It's growing, right? It's increasing. The population isn't decreasing. It's increasing. So let's... See if we can set this up. What's our initial amount? What are we what are we starting with? Jake? 50,000. 50,000. So we're gonna have the amount of people. Well, you could do P for population. I'll just do A for the amount of people as a function of time. Is 50,000 times. Now what's gonna go in the parentheses? once I substitute in for R. So let's, let's just start with that. What's R in this case? Okay. Growth rate <coughs> as a decimal. That's a percent. So I need that as a decimal. Jack? Uh, 0.25. Um, 0.25 as a decimal would mean 25%. Point zero two five, yeah. So it's one plus point zero two five, and the last thing I need is t. Okay. So now I have this hundred thousand. That's the only thing I haven't taken into account yet. Where would that go? Does that get plugged in for an amount, or does that hundred thousand get plugged in? For time. Yeah? It'd be the amount. It's an amount. It's not 100,000 years. That's 100,000 people. So that's going to get plugged in right there. And then we're going to solve. 
So 100,000 equals 50,000 times, and we can add those two together, 1.025 to the t. Now, the way we would have solved this if we were graphing, we would have put what's on the left in y1, we would have put what's on the right in y2, and then what would we have calculated? Yeah? The intersection. The intersection. We would have seen where they crossed. So I can do that real quick, just so we, we get an answer. Uh, it's 100,000, and then 50,000 times 1.025 to the t. All right, let me set my window. Uh, X is the amount of time it's going to take to reach 100,000 people. Well, negative time doesn't make sense. Uh, I think it happened within 25 years. So let's set that to 25 and see. Uh, the smallest my population will be is 50,000, but I want to see when it hits 100,000. So let's do 110 and see what we got. So there's my line at 100,000. There's my population increasing. Oh, I don't think we got it. So it did not happen within 25 years. I gotta go a little bit more. Let's try 35 years. And I think that'll be plenty. Yeah, we're good now. All right, let's just see where those two cross. Right, someone remind me, how do I do an intersect? What do I press? Yep. Second, calc, and then intersect. Pick a point on the blue, the red, do your guess, and it's going to take 28.07 years. Again, I'm not really interested in doing it graphically. I just want something to compare the answer we get when we do it with algebra. Okay, so it's about 28.07. All right, now let's solve this um, using algebra. The first thing I want to do, I want to get T by itself. I could at least get rid of the 50,000. Somebody tell me how I would move that over to the other side. Yeah. Divide by 50,000. Yeah, that's the first thing we'll do. Divide by 50,000. That's gone. And Abigail, um, what do I get on the left? Uh, what do we get on the left? How much? divided by 50,000 is 2. Now we still have to get that t by itself. What's usually involved when there is a variable in the exponent? What do you, what function usually comes up because it helps you to solve for exponents? These things are exponents. Yeah? So, uh, logarithms. Logarithms. Okay. Anytime you have a variable that's in an exponent, we have to use a logarithm. So you might not know why we're doing this right away, but you'll see it in about 30 seconds. Let's take the log of both sides. Okay? Just like you can take the square root of both sides, you can take the log of both sides. Let me do it on both sides. So if we do it on the left, we have the log of 2. And if we do it on the right, we have the log 1.025 to the t. Now, there's something I can do on the right-hand side now because I took a log. What can I do with that t now? This was a rule we learned yesterday, but it only works if you have a log. Yeah? We can put the t in front. That's why I took the log of both sides. That gives me a way to get the t out of the exponent. Otherwise, I can't just take a t and move it in front. 
unless you have a logarithm, then you can. So now we have log 2 equals t times the log of 1.025. Now, what would be my last step uh, to get t by itself? Divide by what's in the parentheses. Divide by the log of 1.025. Log 1.025. That's gone. Divide by log 1.025. And that should come out to 28.07. Right? Let's check. So when you type it in, you just have to be a little bit careful. Log 2. Close the parentheses because you're done with the done with the numerator. Divided by log 1.025. Doesn't really matter if you close the parentheses there because it's the end of the problem. Okay, but I usually just close it. And if you compare the answer we just got to what we got when we did the graph, it's exactly the same thing. So it's about 28.07 years. Now, there's actually an even, I don't know if it's easier, but there's actually a different way to solve that problem that doesn't involve taking the log of both sides. Uh, we, we might talk about that in a little bit. But taking the log of both sides isn't really practical. Any questions on how we solve that algebraically? So not really too many steps. Usually it involves dividing by something, taking the log of both sides, and then you can get that exponent down, not in the exponent, and then it's easier to work with. All right, so that's solving an logarithmic or an exponential equation using a log. The next thing we're going to look at on the calculator is something we haven't, we haven't done before. So in algebra, sometimes or in statistics, you might have a set of data. And it might look like this. And what you do sometimes is you draw in a line. And that's called a line of fit. It's a line that approximates the data points. You try to have as many above as you do below, and you try to make it go through the middle of the points. Well, there's a way in statistics that you can calculate what's called a line of best fit, which means it's the most perfect line you could have for your data. It's as, it calculates the, the most perfect slope and the perfect y-intercept to minimize the distance between the point and the line, because that's what you want to do. You want to keep all these distances as small as possible. Well, sometimes you have data that doesn't look like a line. It looks more maybe like a curve. So what we're going to look at is using the calculator to find what's called a power model. And a power model would be a good fit for that data. A line wouldn't really do a good job. Okay, so these points can be modeled with what's called a power function. And a power function looks something like what's in that box. Your job is to solve for A and to solve for M. And the calculator will, will do that for us. This might kind of look like a polynomial. And if m is an integer, it is. But m can be a fraction. That's not something we normally see in a, well, it's not something you ever see in a polynomial. Okay, you don't have fractional exponents. But in a power model, you can. A and m can be any numbers. And I'm going to show you on the calculator how we, how we find them. All right. Um, so 
So one thing we have to decide when we're trying to fit a power model to data is, should we even be trying to do that? Okay. Not every set of data can be modeled with this particular type of function. If the line, if the points make a straight line, you wouldn't want to use a power model for the data. You would want to use something like y equals mx plus b. That's a straight line. So here's how you first tell if a power model is something you should even be trying to do in the problem. And then if it is, I'll show you how to do it. They're going to give you a table of data. What we're going to do is we're going to put that table of data into the calculator. And we're going to take the ln of every number in that table. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us a new table, just something we're going to use temporarily. And we're going to graph the points in that table and see if they look like they're in a straight line. So we take the original data. We're going to take the natural log of every number that they give us. Usually the table of data has maybe eight numbers in it. It's not, it's not that. We're going to graph it and see if it looks linear. Oh, so let's... Um, let's actually leave, leave room for three more steps, but let me, sh let's do step one on this problem. But leave, I don't know, leave four lines above this so you can write the other four, other three steps. So this question says, determine if a power model is appropriate. That's what I tried to explain how to do in step one. So we're going to do step one right now. And then, if it is appropriate, we're going to actually find what the equation would be. It is important when you write the equation of a power model that it is an equation. A lot of people, like on a test in the past on this, they mess, they mess up like the easy part. Your answer should always be y equals you're going to have to solve for that using the calculator. Then you're going to have an x. And then you're going to have an x ball. I think I called them a and m. Yeah, a and m. But don't forget the y equals part. Some people just put what comes after the equal sign and then they forget the the first part, without an equal sign, it's not an equation. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a new table, and we're only going to use this table temporarily. It's just something we're going to use for one thing, and then we can get rid of it. The only thing it's used for is to figure out, is a power model going to work for that set of data? That's all it is. And this is how you do it. So we have to type all those points into the calculator. So the way you type them in, once you turn it on and you're, you're at the home screen, is you're going to press the stat button. Stat is right below delete. So you're going to press stat. Then it's going to come up with a few different things. Edit, Calc, and Tests. What we want to do is just go to Edit. So Edit is the first option. So I'm going to hit Enter. Now, if I've used it before, there might already be some data in there. I want to get rid of that so it doesn't mess up what I'm going to be doing now. So to get rid of numbers that are already there, just highlight the number you want to get rid of and press Delete. And I'm going to go to L1. I'll just press delete <coughs> to get rid of the numbers. Okay, so now we should all be on a screen that has different lists on it. We're only going to use L1 and L2, and they should be blank. Any questions on how to get to that screen? Any questions on, on that? Okay, 
So now uh, we want to put in the x values in L1. Okay, the way we're going to put them in, one, three, just hit enter after each number. Okay, so you should have a one, a three, a five, and an eight. Okay, any question um, on that? Okay. Now, in L2, we're going to put the y values. We're going to put in 5, 31.2, 73.1, and 160. If you don't have the same number of items in each list, it's going to give you an error. So you should have 4x four X, four X values, 4y values. All right, questions on that? So now that's going to help us to make the LN table we need to. And if we decide from there that a power model is a good fit, we've already done all the work to do the power model as well. Okay, so we're ready to find a power model right now if we want to. But first, we're going to decide if we, if we should. Right. So once you type that in, you can just quit by pre pressing second and then mode. Go back to the main screen. And I want to take the ln of every number I just typed in. Well, I can do the x's first, and then I can do the y's. So you want to press ln, and then you want to press second one. What that says is take the natural log of list one, everything in list one. Okay, so ln, and then I press second one. Hit enter, and that's the ln of every number in list one. So let me write them down. We don't have to write them to too much accuracy because we're going to graph these points. One decimal place is plenty. But that's all you need. So zero. Uh, the ln of three was 1.1. 1. 1. Uh, the next one was ln of 5, which is 1.6. And the last one, I need to scroll over. As long as you haven't done any other calculation, you can scroll. That's what those little arrows mean. Last one is 2.1. So that's a quick way to take the ln of all the x values without having to do them one at a time. Alright, now, what do you think I'm going to do? The ln of what? Yep. The y's. Yeah, the y's. So let's do second, press the number 2, and that'll give me the natural log of every number in list 2. So 1.6. So it's actually the same as this one, and it should be because those numbers were the same. So, so 1.6, um, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 
Uh, 1.6, 4.3. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4.3. And 2.1, 5.1. 2.1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5.1. It'll be about right there. Let me put a line and see how good they look. Do those points look like they are on a pretty straight line? Yes. So now you're done with that LM table. You can forget about it. We don't need it for anything else. So first part, determine if a power model is appropriate. Yes, it is. If it is, find the model. So now that's the next step I'm going to show you how to do. But any question why a power model is appropriate? Okay. So find the model. There are two things you need to find when you do a power model. A and M. Those are the two things. So find <coughs> A. We'll use the calculator and M. Again, use the calculator. And then we're going to write our final answer y equals a x to the m. Your final answer will have an x and a y in it, just like y equals mx plus b. But you're going to solve for a and m. All right, so these are the two things I need to show you how to do, and the calculator gives you both at the same time. If you haven't already typed your data in, that's the first thing you need to do. Okay, we've already done that. All this data is in the calculator. Forget about this LN table. That table had one job. It was to tell us if it was linear. It's done. Okay, we don't need it. Any questions on how to type in the original data? Okay. So now, we're going to go back to stat, but this time we're not going to go to edit. We're going to go to calc. And what we want to calculate is called a power regression. Okay. A regression is the process of finding an equation that fits data. There's all kinds of regressions this calculator can do. We're interested in a power regression, and the result is a power function. So if you scroll down, or you can scroll up, it's probably faster. But if you scroll down on my calculator, when you get to option A, it says power regression. You're going to pick that option, and you hit enter. Now, if you put your x's in L1 and you put your y's in L2, then there's nothing you need to change on this step. If your x's and y's were not in those two lists, you'd have to tell the calculator which lists they were in. And you could do that by just pressing second five. Now I'm telling the calculator my x's are in L5. I don't want to change that, though. So let's leave it. X is in L1, Y is in L2. And again, this will all be in the video too, so if you forget a step, you can always go back and see what I pressed. Then all you have to do is go down to Calculate and press Enter. Okay, the important thing that you should see there is the A and the B. Your calculator may or may not show the R and the R squared. That's some extra information that you don't need. Basically, R tells you how good of an equation the calculator just came up with. One is perfect. In this case, it found a pretty good equation. Okay, 0.9 repeating is it's almost perfect. Right, but we don't really care about R. All right. So now, write your final answer, filling in for those two letters. That's what your book calls those two letters. The calculator calls them A and B. The book calls them A and M. So whatever calculator you're using, it may call them different letters. It doesn't matter. So 
answer is y equals, um, what do you think we should make a? Pretty close to, uh, yep, five. it's five, yeah. So five x, and one point, it's almost like 1.6 repeating. Okay, when the six repeats that many times, or any number repeats that many times, let's assume that that pattern would just continue, right? So this is really 1.6 repeating, or one and two thirds, which would be what as a um, improper fraction? Yep. One would be five thirds. That's basically five thirds. So there's your equation. 5x to the 5 thirds. Now, what I want to do is I want to graph that and see, well, how good of a fit is that? Okay, you don't have to graph it. I just want you to watch. Just watch me do it. So for my window, I need to go from 0 to 10 on my x's. That'll, that'll be good enough. For my y's, I'm going to go from 0 to 200. Okay, I'm just trying to get a, a window that's going to fit all these points. All right, so let's do, that's way too big, 0 to 200. And I'm making what's called a scatter plot. So I have to turn on one of my scatter plots. I can do that by going up to plot 1 and hitting enter. You don't have to graph it. Okay, again, you just can watch me do it. I'm going to clear out all that old stuff, hit graph, and those are the four points. If I trace, it's kind of hard to see. 3, 31.2. That's that point right there. 3, 31.2. So there's a picture of all those points. Now, I want to graph that equation we just came up with and see how good does that go through the points. 5x raised to the 5 thirds. So does it seem like that curve is a pretty good fit to the data? Yeah. We already knew from the numbers. It basically was, was perfect. That gave me that value that told me how good it was. And it was almost 1. It was like 0.9 repeating. So when I graph it, I expected it to go through all those points basically perfectly. Okay, And that's called a power model. You don't have to graph it to see how good of a fit it is. We already knew it was going to be a good fit. That's why we did this. We are checked beforehand to see if a power model was the right tool to use. And that told us that it was. All right. Any questions on that? All right, so the last thing we're going to look at is 5.5. .5, and you're going to see some things here that are pretty familiar. We're going to talk about transformations, shifting left and right, up and down, all the stuff that we've done before. Okay, so we'll, we'll do a quick review just to make sure we remember, like, plus moves in which way, minus moves in which way. But it's going to be exactly the same as some stuff we've done before. So... One thing we've talked about is on the calculator, there are only two bases that it can do for logarithms. Does anybody remember one of the bases that the calculator has a button for? Is that? Yep, base 10 is one of them. Anybody remember the other one? Yep. E. E. So if I give you a problem other than base 10 or base E, I haven't shown you how to type it in. I'm going to show you how to do it right now. I'll actually show you two ways to do it. I would pick one way to remember, but they're both the same. If you have to take a log and the base is any number besides a 10 or an E, this is how you do it. You can do it with common log. Take the common log of the argument and divide by the common log of the base. 
Or you could do it with natural log. Take the natural log of the argument and take over the natural log of the base. It is important which one goes where. And the way I remember it, base, think of the base of something, the base of something is on the bottom. Base goes on the bottom, argument goes on top. Base, bottom. Okay, I'll do an example each way, but I usually just stick with one way, and that's, that's fine. All right, so let me show you an example with numbers. Let's say log base 5 of 13. Don't have a button for base 5. So could somebody give me one way that I could type this in to get the answer? it in just like that and let's see what you get. So log 13, close that parenthesis because we're done with that, divided by log 5 and there's your answer. Now what else could I have done besides log 13 over log 5? What's the, the other way I could have typed it in? Oh, Ethan? Oh, I didn't get the other one. It was, I know it was LN, but... I yeah, didn't... just replace log with LN. Oh. Right? It's exactly the same thing. We could do LN 13 divided by LN 5. There is no difference. It's the same answer. So again, just pick one way to remember how to do it, and then just stick with that. Whichever way you want. But that's how you type in a log that's not a base 10 or a base E. All right, so now let's try graphing this. Log base three of X. I can't type that in the way it's written. So can somebody tell me how I can rewrite it so I can type that in on Y1? do LNX over LN3. We could have done log X over <coughs> log 3. It would have been the same thing. All right, and let's type that in, and let's see what it looks like. In fact, I'll type both in just so you can see. I'm going to shut my scatter plot off because I'm done with that. Let's do LNX divided by ln3, and I'm going to do just this one time, log x divided by log3. So hopefully you'll see it trace right over it in red. It's exactly the same. Okay, so there's no need to type it in twice. Um, remember though that that graph is a little bit kind of misleading. The calculator didn't really draw it perfect. What what should be happening in that graph? Yep. It should be going down as well. It should be going down forever. It almost looks like it starts at the point zero negative two. No. It does go down forever. None of my calculators will draw logarithms correctly because they get very steep. That's the problem. All right. So looking at that graph, um, what does it look like the domain is? Thinking about left and right. How far left and right does that graph go? Yeah, Jake? Uh, so between, it's anything greater than zero. Anything greater than zero. So we're going to say zero to infinity, but he said greater than zero. And he's right because there is a vertical, think of like a vertical asymptote here. 
This never touches the y-axis. Okay. And how about my range? This is the same range for every log function. I think we did it yesterday. Yeah, Tyler? All real numbers. Okay. Any uh, questions on that? Let's take a look at the uh, transformation problem. <coughs> a, B, C, and D are the standard transformations that we always apply to functions. Remember, it could be a plus or a minus. That will move in different ways. But does anybody remember what A will do? That's adding or subtracting inside the parentheses. Which way would that move my graph? Yep. Would that be a horizontal shift? That's your horizontal shift. Yep. Remember, plus is going to go to the left. Minus is going to go to the right. So it's the opposite of what you would expect. What about B? Anybody remember what B does? It's still inside, so it's going to have something in common with A, but now it's multiplication. It's not addition. Yeah? The horizontal stretch. Right. It's still horizontal, but this time it's a stretch. Multiplying is always a stretch. Adding and subtracting is always a shift. And when it's inside, it's horizontal. All right. How about C? That's multiplying, but now we're on the outside. You think they can tell me what C would do? Jack? Vertical stretch. Good. That's your vertical stretch. Um, well, we're talking about that. What happens if C is a negative number? What does that cause your graph to do, Tyler? Reflection. That's a reflection. If B is negative, that's a horizontal reflection. If C is negative, it's a vertical reflection. And lastly, what about D? Back to adding and subtracting, but this time on the outside. Yeah? A vertical shift. Vertical shift. You need to really point out positive and negative there because it's what you would expect. Positive is up, negative is down. All right, so now let's look at two logarithms, and I'm going to ask you how you would change one into the other. Whenever you're comparing two logarithms, the bases have to be the same. I wouldn't have you compare like a base 5 log to a base 7 log. That, that doesn't make sense. So I'm going to have you compare a base 3 log to a base 3 log. So the first thing is how, basically, what that negative would do. That's the first thing I want to know. And then we'll find domain, range, and vertical asymptotes. All right, so let's start with the transformations. How many transformations would it take to get from what's in the black box to what's in the red box? How many transformations would you have to do to it? Go, oh, Casey. Just one. There's only one transformation to get from the black one to the red one. So most of this stuff isn't even going to happen in this problem. There's only one thing there that's going to happen. And you're focusing on the B. The B is what's different in this problem. There's no A, there's no C, there's no D. It's the B. Yep? Horizontal stretch of by factor of negative one. Um, 
So stretching something by like a fact, we always stretch by a positive number. Oh, so never, that'd be a reflection. It's a reflection. So the negative doesn't really cause a stretch. It causes a reflection. And that's it for the transformations. Horizontal reflection. Some people like to say reflect over the y-axis. You could also say that. That's a horizontal reflection. And now, describe the domain, the range, and the vertical asymptotes. Well, we already have a picture of the original problem. Right here. So let's think about what that would look like if we reflected it horizontally. It would look, and this comes down. Do it in red. Here's the reflection. So it would look kind of kind of like that. Alright, so what would be the domain? of the graph in black. Yeah, Chris? Negative infinity to zero, yeah. not including zero. Not including zero. So negative infinity to zero. Uh, what else? Domain, range. What would the range of the graph in black be? Yeah? All real numbers. Yeah, still all real numbers. No matter what you do, you can't change the range in a log function. And the vertical asymptote, can somebody remind me, when you have a vertical asymptote, what letter does it start with? Is it X or Y? Ethan? X. Yep, X equals. And where does it look like the vertical asymptote is in this problem? X equals what number? Yep. Zero. Zero. It's also X equals zero in the red one. It's the same asymptote. And that was it. Okay. So any questions on describing the transformation or finding the new domain and range? All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. So another uh, transformation problem. They've given you this one a little tricky. What's what's weird about that? I mean, compare what I just underlined to what's right there. Yeah. Shouldn't the three be on the other side of here? Yeah, we usually put the x first and we put the three second. So this should really be log. Um, Jake, how would you rewrite that? Would be negative x plus three. Negative x plus 3. Okay. So now, how many transformations to turn that into that? Two. 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 So there are two transformations. What would be the first thing you would do to the graph in red to turn it into the graph in blue? Yeah, Sarah? Uh, shift left three. Yep, we would shift left three, and if you're not sure of the order, that's why I used A, B, C, D. That's the order you always listen in. So let's shift <coughs> left three. All right, and what would we do after we shift left three? Yep. Uh, horizontal reflection. Then we do a horizontal reflection. Questions on those two transformations? All right. So um, let's see. Okay. So the second to last thing we're going to look at is sketching a log function. Okay, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. As long as you can find the vertical asymptote, then you know your log is going to bend away from it. 
It's, only, it's gonna bend in one of two directions. It normally will always bend to the right. The only way it could bend left is if you do a horizontal reflection. Right? But once you find that vertical asymptote, then you know it's gonna bend away from it, one of two ways. Sometimes finding the intercepts is helpful. Um, I'm gonna probably skip, skip that. So it's helpful to find the vertical asymptote. I mean, I guess the x and the y intercept can be helpful, but I'm not gonna to worry too much about them. I'll, I'll find them on the calculator if I want them. But this is how you find the vertical asymptote. You set the argument of the log function, which is just this part. Don't care about anything else. Just the part that's in that box. Set that equal to zero and solve. That will give you the vertical asymptote. If you want to find the intercepts, uh, you can. Every graph will have an x-intercept. It has to. Because think about the range. It's going to go up and down forever. So if it goes up and down forever, it's going to cross the x-axis at some point. But not every graph has a y-intercept. Depends. The graph that we did a couple minutes ago, this one, um, wherever it is, that graph does not have a y-intercept. It'll never cross the y-axis. It'll get close, but it won't, it won't cross it. So we'll find a couple points, and then just remember that when you plug a number into a log function, it's always supposed to be positive. So you have to think about what kind of numbers you can plug in. They're either going to go to the right of the asymptote, or they're going to go to the left. They're not going to go both directions. But other than making sure the argument is positive, you can take any x value you want and plug it in. I usually stick to numbers that are under 10 because that's the size of my graph paper, so that's what I do. All right, so let's uh, finish up with a, with a sketch. So I want to sketch a graph of log base 2 of 3x plus 5. Now, to do the sketch, I need that anyway. So I'm actually going to do that first. To find the vertical asymptote, what did I say you have to do? Take what's in the parentheses instead of equal to zero. Yep, exactly. To find the vertical asymptote, set the argument, which is what's in the parentheses, equal to zero, and solve. Okay, bring the five to the other side. And then divide by three. That's my vertical asymptote. Let's, uh, let's graph that while we have it. What's negative 5 thirds? It has a decimal, roughly. Jeff? Negative 1.66. Yeah, it's like negative 1.6 repeating. So let's put in a, and again, I want that to be a dotted line because that's how I usually do the um, asymptote. So about negative 1.6, so about right there. Now my graph is going to bend away from that line in one of two directions. 
I can do it by hand, but I'm going to use the table to get some more points quicker. So let's type in log 3x plus 5. And I, got, I have to type it in this way because it's a base 2. I don't have a button for base 2. Divided by log 2. All right. So let's try typing in the number that's the vertical asymptote, negative 5 thirds. We should get an error. Negative 5 thirds. Negative 5 thirds. And we do. We get an error because that's the asymptote. <coughs> let's try picking numbers to the right. I'm pretty sure this graph goes to the right because I'm looking at that. I don't see a negative next to the x, which means there's been no reflection. So it's going to go to the right. Let's try 0, 2, 5, and 10. I think that'll probably be enough points. Notice I, I just left this on here from another problem I did, but when you try to go the other way, you get an error because the graph doesn't bend to the left. It goes to the right. All right, so 0, 2.3. Uh, let's see, 2, 3.5. 1, 2, 3, about right there. Um, 5, we're at 4.3. 4, 4.3. And 8, 4.8. I don't even think I did that one, but I can use it. 8. So like 4.9. 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, point 0.9. So you can start to see a little bit of the curve. Remember, it's going to come in towards the asymptote and drop down uh, forever. So getting closer and closer to that, but never touching it. All right. So um, we've got the asymptote. X equals negative 5 thirds. Um, how about my <coughs> domain? What's my domain in that one? Yeah. Anything greater than negative 5 thirds? Yeah, everything greater than negative 5 thirds. So no bracket. And what about my range? Yeah, it's all real number. It's going to go up and down forever. Okay. So any uh, questions on that? Okay. So that's uh, that's everything with with logs. Oh, so the first part, a uh, couple of these are on making a power model on the calculator and solving a log equation um, algebraically. Uh, I need to just adjust a couple problems, so just give me one second. Um, 35 and 36, that's fine. 43. Alright, um, so we don't have do this one. And 301. Okay, so on 293, those four questions, 35, 36, 43, 48. And then on 301, um, those questions right there, just up to 42. 